this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and today we're going to look at the Microsoft Surface Pro, Microsoft's second piece of PC hardware and their first full Intel Core i5 tablet. Really neat product here, certainly an engineering feat. 10.6 inch display, full HD, half an inch thick, so still pretty thin. Looks a lot like the Surface RT, but unlike RT, this one actually runs full Windows apps. And on the back here, you can see the same vapor magnesium casing. It comes with this digital pen here, Wacom technology inside. We'll talk about that in great detail. And of course, you can use Microsoft, which, and of course, you can use Microsoft's type covers, which this is right here, and their touch covers as well with it. We're going to look at it now. So here it is. After months of anticipation, the Microsoft Surface Pro. This is both a tablet and an Ultrabook at the same time. How does that work? Well, it looks a lot like the Surface RT tablet, doesn't it? 10.6 inch display, very compact, just a hair over a half an inch thick, so not very big. Works with both the touch and the type covers. This one right now is the type cover. It's a little bit thicker. It's got keys that actually move. But inside it has an Intel Core i5 ULV CPU, 1.7 gigahertz. That's the same CPU you'll find on many Ultrabooks on the market. So it can do all of those things, computationally speaking, that an Ultrabook can do. It has 4 gigs of DDR3 RAM soldered onto the motherboard, and you can get it with either a 64 or 128 gig SSD. That's a true MSATA SSD. It's not the eMMC kind of SD sort of interface that's used on Intel Atom convertibles with touch screens and transformers. So for your $899, you'll get a 64 gig Surface Pro, but go ahead and get the 128 gig for $100 more, $999. You double your storage, and uh, there's been plenty of talk about that, but you get only 30 gigs free on the 64 gig, and you get 90 gigs free on the 128 gig, which is much more usable, certainly. I, if you're going to spend that much money, just go for it. Anyway, for that price, you get this pen that does clip on magnetically to the charging port right here. And this is a Wacom pen. It's interchangeable with other Wacom pens. We'll explore that a little bit more later. But you don't get a keyboard. There's no bundle right now with the keyboard cover. Now, you can choose, of course, to use an external USB keyboard or a Bluetooth keyboard, but this is a pretty neat accessory. This one is the type cover. And the type cover is the one with the actual clicky moving keys. So for those of you who tried the Surface Touch Cover, which is just a flat surface, and went crazy without the tactile feedback, this one's probably a better choice. It does have a trackpad built in, a kind of small one, it's adequate, and it has the same kind of felt back on it. And when you close it, it'll shut the surface off. However, it doesn't always wake it up, I noticed, on the Pro model. I don't know if that's a power saving feature or what. And for those of you who haven't seen it before, here it is. This is the Touch Cover. A little bit thinner, where well, they're both actually quite thin and they weigh almost the same. We're talking about less than a half of an ounce difference between the two. So weight really isn't an issue between the type cover with the clicky keys and the touch cover. But here it is, it's very flat and when you plug it in you'll hear the, the uh, sound effects on the device itself and it really does help with typing. A little <coughs> See that you know you are typing because these do not move. They're a little bit sculpted, you feel them, but that's it. Of course this guy is available in a whole bunch of different colors. This is a $120 and the one with the clicky keys is $130 and Microsoft has some new designer ones of these and colors with pattern on the back and those are going to be $130 as well. The included charger is pretty. We don't get to say that very often but it's very good looking. It's nicely made. Here's your two prong adapter, not the usual three prong that we see. Small block style charger with a USB charging port here so you can charge your smartphone if you want to right there in the hole. 48 watt per hour charger. Decent amount of cord on here, and it uses the same magnetic connector just about as RT. This little guy here, but it has bigger connectors. It's, it does have to transfer more power, and it clips on a little bit more easily. If we turn this on its side, you can see you can put it either up or down, doesn't really matter. And it doesn't take as much fiddling to get in place, but still a little bit. It's not like the, the type and touch covers that really just locate themselves and womp right on. Once you get it on, it's pretty secure, and you can put it on either way, like I said. There's a little light here that indicates charging, so if you put it that way, you can actually see the little light and know that it's doing it. So, a little less fiddly, but still kind of fiddly. And when you're not charging it, see the pin here has stick out prominence kind of thing right here, and that goes in. It's also magnetic, and you can just stick it in right there. It's reasonably secure. Yes, you can knock it off, especially because you tend to pick it up and carry it from the sides. And if you poke it enough, it's going to fall off. If you put it in your bag, it might fall off. But it, it's a way to help you not lose track of it, since it's pretty rare to see a, a silo or a garage these days for digital pens and these very thin devices. 
And for those who haven't seen this in action, just put it pretty well near it. Boy, does that really womp on. And yeah, just like you've seen on the commercials, you can actually pick it up and carry it just by the keyboard section, though, you know, it makes me nervous to do that, but you can do it. It's a very, very insanely strong magnet. So as we take a look around the device, you can see it has the same built-in kickstand, slightly different angle from the RT, but same vag Maper Vagnesium alloy casing as well, kind of a nearly black, dark titanium finish. Certainly strong enough, you, you could use it to prop it up in portrait mode if you wanted to as well, although obviously it's so tall that, you know, you get some just wobble there going on because of the height, but you could do it. There is nothing underneath the flap. The micro SD card slot that was on the RT has been relocated to the side on this device right over there. And that's our charging connector port over there. And this is a mini display port. Now mini display port might seem like a pain in the neck, but it can drive higher resolution displays than 1920 by 1080. So it's pretty versatile in that respect. Now Microsoft sells adapter for 39 bucks you can go from mini display port to VGA and there's also one to go to HDMI and there are third party adapters as well I have one that I paid about 20 bucks for that goes from mini display port to HDMI if you notice the little ridges right here or little vent ridge rather running around this is the ventilation opening. Pretty interesting. Instead of having the, the classic big vents that you see on computers, it vents all along the side. And this does have fans inside, but most of the time it's quiet. And when they do kick on, I was actually playing Civ 5 for an hour and a half with this. I, it, it's not that annoying. It sounds pretty much like an Ultrabook fan, but a little bit quieter. Some folks have complained about it it's sounding like a high-pitched, annoying whine. I, this, certainly ours hasn't. Power button is up here. And you can see the angle to the to the edges here. It's got a, it's kind of different profile than the RT because it's a little bit thicker. Modern looking, attractive, definitely. And on this side, we've got our 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, volume controls, and this is our single USB 3.0 port. And of course, on the bottom, here's our magnetic connector for the keyboards. The tablet weighs 2 pounds versus 1.5 for the RT tablet and 1.44 pounds for the iPad to give you some relative ideas. And I do notice the difference. A 1.5 pound tablet in this size, it's not bad. It's reasonably comfortable to hold. A lot of tablets are around that weight. But when you get up to 2 pounds, it does start to feel kind of heavy. It also feels warm on the back pretty much all the time. It's always going to be a little bit warm. Not hot, not going to burn you kind of thing, but it will be warm. That's because you're looking at a computer stuffed into a 10.6 inch tablet. If you're doing something like playing games or processing some video, it'll get warm. Definitely a little bit more than just warm, but nothing burning hot, nothing unpleasant. You probably don't want to hold it in both hands while you're doing something like that, but then again when you're gaming you probably won't be holding it in your hands. You probably, I mean serious gaming like, well, Skyrim or something like that. I don't mean the casual games that you can get from the Microsoft Store. Those kind you probably aren't going to be holding it in your hand. You're going to have it propped up. You might even use an external monitor. Likewise, if you're editing HD video. But it's not a cool product, literally cool to cold product like the RT tablet or like Intel Atom Windows 8 tablets. The display is full 1080p, capacitive 10 points of multi-touch plus the active digitizer with the included EMR pen. Beautiful looking screen, very nice. Uh, I compared it to my Sony Vio Duo 11, that one has a little bit richer colors, I'd say. But other than that, certainly a lovely looking display. Multi-touch works beautifully on it. No complaints there. Desktop looks pretty enough. And here you can see what, how much detail that you can actually see on the background here. Uh, this is one of the more detailed Windows 8 backgrounds that you can use. A lot of striations here, color gradations. And certainly it's a noticeable difference from the RT tablet that runs at 1366 by 768 and a lot of other Windows 8 tablets that run at that lower resolution. Colors are reasonably saturated. Glare is held reasonably well in check for something with a glossy display, but there certainly is some glare. And brightness is good, not stellar, not stunning, not, wow, it's going to burn my retinas bright, but it's more than adequate for a bright room. Outdoor use, it's going to be a little hard to see, though. This is Gorilla Glass too, so it should be durable and strong. Now, one thing about having a full 1080p display, right now we have desktop scaling set to 125%. You can see the size of our icons. They're kind of teeny, but you can read the labels, all that kind of thing. Microsoft ships it at 150% zoom, which makes it visually equivalent to 1366 by 768 anyway. 
So that gets to, well, how good are your eyes and what is it you're looking for in a tablet? That's a lot of resolution to cram in here given the way Windows handles scaling in desktop mode. It's obviously just fine when you get right here because it handles all the scaling for you. If you have good eyes, you're going to love that 1080p. If you do a lot of HD video watching, you're also going to love it. If most of the time you're just doing productivity stuff like word processing and all that, or if you're older and your eyes aren't so good, you might end up spending most of your time in 150% scaling mode. Now, keep in mind also when you're playing some games, you, you may have to set scaling back to 100%. Some apps actually honor whatever the scaling setting is in Windows, and some don't. Like Photoshop doesn't, for example. Everything is going to look teeny tiny no matter what you set your scaling to. But World of Warcraft, you're better off starting out with 100%, just 100% zoom, normal zoom on the desktop. And so instead of something scaled, you might see some strange behavior. Now, here's an interesting thing while we're talking about resolutions and scaling. This one over here is the Surface Pro. This one over here is the RT tablet. Now, we're using IE10 from the Metro Live Tile UI, which runs in full screen mode. And you can see, you can actually see a little bit more of a web page on the RT. Go figure, it's just the way scaling is handled. And while we have these two side by side, you can see that really it would be hard to tell which one is which. They look just about identical. Other than some of the ports moving around and the thickness of the devices, they are really nearly dead ringers for each other. If we turn sideways, you can see. Now we have them sideways, and you can see that Pro is a little bit thicker, but other than that, you're looking at something very similar. The Surface Pro scores 4657 on PC Mark 7, and that's pretty much par for the course for an Intel Core i5 ULV Ultrabook. And you can see our Windows Experience Index here on a scale of 1 to 9.9. .9. Calculations per second, which is processor, is 6.9. Memory is 5.9. Graphics for desktop performance, 5.6. 3D gaming graphics, 6.4. And primary hard disk, 8.1, which is usually what we see for an SSD drive. So certainly capable and powerful. And all that horsepower and performance, which really is good enough to play certainly casual games, even some less demanding current games, like I've been playing Civ 5, as I mentioned. We're going to talk a little bit more in gaming in detail. Productivity applications, Adobe Photoshop, all those things, they are a go on this. So it makes it a little bit of a confusing beast, doesn't it? It looks like a tablet, acts like a tablet. It's only 10.6 inches. That's really quite an engineering marvel to get all of that in here and get adequate cooling and all that stuff going on as well. But it also means that it's a little bit neither here nor there. It's really lovely as a tablet, but at two pounds it's a bit heavy and it gets warm. And with battery life hovering around four and a half to five hours for us, it doesn't last as long as a mobile OS tablet. Obviously, it can do a lot more, to be fair, on that front, but there are Intel Atom Windows 8 tablets, too, that are not as powerful, but they can do all the same stuff. They're running full Windows 8 as well, and they last eight hours on a charge, so there's that. But when you use it as a laptop with this kind of thing, this isn't bad if you're using the, the type cover. The touch cover for serious typists, not so much. It's great for typing casual, quick emails, doing entering URLs, that kind of thing, but the type cover is definitely better for typing. It's still in a 10.6 inch frame. It is fairly compact. It's not as comfy as using something with a laptop design. So that's why reviewers have been saying it's, it's not the perfect laptop and it's not the perfect tablet. It's a little heavy for a tablet. It's not the ideal ergonomics for a laptop. Now, of course, you can do things like use a Bluetooth external keyboard with this, plug in an HDMI monitor, turn this guy into an actual workstation on your desk. So I'm not saying it's bad. It's just different. For those of you who don't mind two pounds of weight, and really, that's not so bad. There are convertibles out there that weigh three to 3.5 pounds. So hey, still two pounds isn't that bad. What does this offer you? Digital note-taking with the included pen. You graphic artists, you, you can draw on this. Now, some folks might want a bigger screen to draw on. 12.1 used to be kind of the standard for, for Windows tablets for graphic artists, but now we're, we're seeing a lot of 11.6s. 10.6, I still find pretty usable for drawing, but so it certainly has its appeal there, and it makes a lot of sense as a tablet form factor, and as particularly a Windows tablet, because you can use all those graphic apps, and you can use OneNote and Windows Journal and all those applications with it. And as we talk about those products that actually compete with the Surface Pro, this is the HP Envy X2. Looks like a laptop, feels like a laptop, beautiful aluminum casing, 11.6 inch. This runs on an Intel Atom 1.8 gigahertz dual core, Windows 8 32-bit versus 64-bit on the Pro. This guy is not as smart. However, it's a lot more like a laptop when it's docked. And for those of you who really need a good keyboard and long battery life, the HP stands out. So 
as we open it up and look inside, you can see the difference. This guy looks like a laptop, but you release the hinge and the 1.5 pound tablet comes out a lot thinner, lighter, easier to hold. But aha, uh -huh, this is not going to play Civ 5. This will do Photoshop. It's going to take longer to launch Photoshop, but it won't be so bad once it runs. You're not going to be doing HD video editing on this. I would not want to use this for software development. It's just not that smarter product. And this sells for 750 bucks, so it's not that cheap either. 750 to 850 depending on where you look, honestly. But with the keyboard dock, the NV runs for about 11, 11 and a half hours on a charge. Whoa, that's a lot more than four and a half to five. So if your needs are light, this could make more sense. You do mostly just MS Office, web browsing, that kind of thing. And now we have it next to the Sony VAIO Duo 11. This is probably the most popular Windows convertible tablet, Windows 8 convertible, 11.6 inches. So it's bigger. It's also almost three pounds, so it's going to be heavier. But this guy has a built-in keyboard, so you don't have to do the flip cover thing. So when you open it up, here it is as a convertible with a built-in keyboard. Not the world's greatest built-in keyboard, though. Pretty tiny. You can see, not huge, even though it's 11.6 inches and there is more room. What's different about the Sony, though, is it has a lot of ports. It's much more like an Ultrabook in that respect. You get a full-size SD card slot. You get VGA. You get HDMI. You get an Ethernet port. And you get two USB ports right here. So, for those of you who are looking for something that's an all-around laptop replacement, a convertible may, may make more sense because you do get things like, well, a lot more ports. Battery life on the Sony, also not really great. But you can get a clip-on battery for the Sony that does extend battery life. And lastly, we have it with the Acer Iconia W700, also a full-core i5 Windows 8 64-bit tablet that weighs 2 pounds. This guy is made of a single piece of aluminum for the back here, also has Gorilla Glass 2, also full 1080, but it's 11.6 inches, so, so you can see that it's going to be bigger. So it really depends what you want. If you want extreme portability, Surface Pro certainly makes sense because it's going to be even smaller than this guy, and a little bit less awkwardly mm, elongated rectangular feeling since Surface Pro is smaller. So how about gaming? It is certainly capable of playing any game that's on the Microsoft Store that's built into the Windows 8 operating system. It can play things like Left 4 Dead 2. It can play older games like Rise of Nations. Civ 5 plays just fine at 1080p, and we'll show you that in a minute. Now, I also tried Skyrim, and Skyrim, even with most effects off or set to low, well, not at 1080p. It only ran about 20 frames per second, so you have to drop that down to 1366 by 768. World of Warcraft, as long as you set your scaling to 100% first on the desktop, a little glitchy with that kind of thing, you can actually play that. Not, not at full 1080p, but you can. So we're going to play Civ, and you can see here we have options. You always have the DirectX 9 and DirectX 11, but here's a neat new option that they have, DirectX 9 for Windows 8 Touch Enabled. And we're going to go with that one. And you can see how the pen works with the hover, by the way. I'm changing this just by hovering over it without touching. And you can see this is the graphic settings that we're using. Full 1080p, anti-aliasing is off. Most things set to low, a few things set to medium. So now we're inside the game, and this is a game that I played for about an hour and a half, so it's pretty well along. I've got four cities here. I've already gotten a fight with Rome. Works well. We have Fraps running here, but Fraps seems to be going a little bit wonky and crazy on this, so I wouldn't trust it in this case. It generally plays very smoothly and looks good. We can do things like zoom in like that, and you can use the keyboard and all those controls as well. And you can see how long it takes thinking about turns. Got a full map of turns to, to manage here, so. Certainly very playable. And the, the time it takes to do turns at this point in the game this far along is also very reasonable. So that's Civ 5. Again, Skyrim will work, but go down to 1366 by 768 if you want good frame rates on that. 
Games like Left 4 Dead 2, older games, those will play. Crisis 2, no, not so much. The latest Call of Duty, no, not. This is still a, an Intel Ultrabook with the ULV CPU. Now, when we were gaming, you probably noticed the fan. It certainly is audible. It doesn't squeal, it doesn't whine in a high-pitched way, but you can definitely hear it blowing when you're in a game. CPU temperatures themselves, however, are pretty good. It keeps it at a reasonable upper 50s when gaming, which is fine. The, the max thermal temp for this is 105 centigrade for the CPU itself. You also know, probably noticed that the sound wasn't very loud. Well, guess what? The speakers on this are every bit as anemic as they are in RT. You get stereo speakers here? Gosh, they're not loud. Headphone, audio, awesome. But speakers themselves, not so much. We'll try some music so you can hear that. Here it is, and our sound is at 72 right now, which is relatively high. And this is a fairly loudly recorded track, so it's pretty good. Sound quality isn't bad. Of course, it's not going to have a lot of oomph for bass because it's a small product, but loud, not so much. And if we look at it and listen to video, we've got some 1080p video we can test out on this. This is an MPEG-4 high-profile, 5-channel, 1080p trailer. Barely loud enough to fill up a room. If you set it to maximum, it will, and then you'll start to notice it's sounding a little bit thin and tinny, but... But it can handle the video just fine. Plenty of horsepower for this. And now we're going to look at apps that work with the pen. We're going to look at both note-taking applications and art applications. So here's the included digital pen. Yes, it is a Wacom pen. Small standard tip here. Good size, normal. We've got an eraser up here. Oddly, they went with a, a flat top, kind of like a brand new pencil would have, but you, a lot of us tend to erase on an angle, and that's maybe not so ideal. And this here isn't just the locator to lock it into the charging port. This is actually a button as well. So here we are in Windows Journal. You can see we have just fine palm rejection. Pretty nasty handwriting there. Let's see if we can convert that over to text. I had trouble with the word palm, but otherwise I got it right. Most of the time it actually does a good job of getting it right, and we could say okay and have it insert it in the document. In this case, we won't. I'm going to show you something else. This is the stylus from my Samsung Galaxy Note 2 smartphone, also a Wacom pen. Works just fine. And you can see I, it keeps up my fast handwriting perfectly well. This is an older Wacom pen enabled pen from the pre bamboo days. And it works well too. There you have it. Wacom inside. Wacom drivers right now for graphic artists? Mm, not so much, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Likewise, this works just fine in OneNote. So now we're looking at pen functionality, and we're in OneNote 2013 using the included pen. Keeps up just fine. Does a very nice job. Nice smooth inking right here. And small type, but you can see it recognizes it just fine. Works well. Lovely, lovely for note taking. Nice size, reasonable weight. So let's look at some art applications. This is Art Rage Pro 3.5, which works just fine. It uses just general Windows APIs. It doesn't require WinTab. So we have pressure sensitivity. I've been working on my Apple over here, and you can see I've got a thin pencil selected right now. And now I'm going to draw a very light line, and it's very faint. So definitely pressure sensitivity there. 
diagonal lines are reasonably sharp, even if I go slow. You know, the hard thing about diagonal line tests is it is hard to hold your hand steady when you go slower. But it tracks quite well. Works nicely there. And the eraser actually erases. So great in Art Rage Pro. And now we're in Corel Painter 12, and you can see I've been working on yet another apple. I just love apples using the soft pastel tool, but what we don't have here is pressure sensitivity. If you need pressure sensitivity today in Corel Painter 12, you're not going to get it. Now we've reached out to Wacom or Wayne to find out if and when they're going to offer WinTab drivers so we can get pressure sensitivity in Photoshop and hopefully in Corel Painter as well, but as for right now, no. You can still do some nice artwork here, but well, there's no pressure sensitivity. And lastly, we're in Autodesk Sketchbook Pro 6 here, and you can see that we have pressure sensitivity. Drawing light, drawing heavy, drawing very light, drawing heavy. Obvious pressure sensitivity there, so that works fine. So if this is your bag, this is your favorite application, you're good to go out of the box. Again, I hope that we do see Wacom WinTab drivers for those applications that require it, mostly Adobe Apps, Corel Painter would be good as well. Don't know when we will. I hear that they're very complicated to develop, those drivers, so it certainly is possible that they will appear with time. Now, as I mentioned, battery life on this, about four and a half to five hours on a charge, and that's with brightness set at about 50%, which is pretty adequate and with Wi-Fi on and active. So, yeah, it's not going to beat out Atom tablets or ARM-based tablets like Android tablets or the iPad, but then again, if you're comparing it to a Windows notebook, which it has the internals of, it's actually reasonable. Unfortunately, Microsoft does not make an extended battery for this at this point. Everybody's hoping they're going to make a snap-on battery cover or something like that. I'm not sure how I could see how they could actually fit it and keep something reasonably thin, but there it is. Like the RT tablet, it has front and rear 720p cameras. 720p, we're not talking like Wow, great back camera there. It's pretty miserable if you're going to take photos or, or shoot video. It's adequate certainly for video chat and Skype, that kind of thing, but it, it's behind the competition in terms of rear camera quality. Now, some people say, oh, I never take pictures with a tablet anyway, and well, for those of you who would never do that, that's great. Tablet has dual band Wi-Fi 802.11bg, and that's made by Marvel, same as with the RT tablet. Because it's Marvel and not Intel, you do not get Wi-Di wireless display, which is an Intel technology. So you're going to actually have to use a mini display port to HDMI connector if you want to play stuff to your TV, or start playing around with DLNA. It has Bluetooth 4.0 as well. So who is the Surface Pro for? Well, it's somebody who's looking for the ultimate in ultra portability. Obviously, I think a lot of people are going to look at it and say, oh, this is neat, this is cool, I want one. And whether or not it fits in your lifestyle really depends on what you want. As a main computer, it, the good point and the bad point is it's very small. At 10.6 inches and 2 pounds, it's wildly portable. If you spend a lot of time on the go, that, that can save you a lot of weight and that can mean a lot to you. But also means a more cramped keyboard experience unless you want to use an external USB or Bluetooth keyboard and a smaller display to look at unless you want to plug in a bigger monitor. So if you're cool with those things, bring it home, plug it into some bigger peripherals, and you want extreme portability on the road and the full power of a Core i5, well, it's for you. It's also awesome for note takers. It's a, it's a nice comfortable size for note taking. At two pounds, really, it's not as punishing as you might think. Certainly, it's better than three pound convertibles that are on the market. Excellent for inking. Uh, it's good for graphic artists as long as you don't rely on WinTab drivers for Wacom right now. You you know what those are if you're if you're a graphic artist. But if you use ArtRage, if you use Alias Sketchbook Pro, well, you're going to be happy with it. You're going to get pressure sensitivity. And again, it's a very nice size to just hold on your lap and draw and digitally paint with. So that's the Surface Pro. It's available now starting at $8.99, though apparently it's sold out in the first day of availability, at least in the 128 gigs, so it may be hard to find one. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review of the Surface Pro, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.